Um, right, let's get on with it, shall we? Um, please give a huge round of applause, which we will imagine ourselves, to Robin Geigel and Kia Abdullah. Welcome to you both. Good evening. How are you? Hi, Rob. Thank you very much for having us. It's really exciting uh, to be on the same panel with Robin. Uh, I loved her book, so I can't wait to discuss it. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Kia. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure. And Kia, I loved your book as well. So, <laughs> thank you. Okay, there we go. I managed to mute myself there. That was the first and only mistake that's going <laughs> to happen this evening. Um, all right, just to begin with, uh, I'm going to ask each of you uh, to give us a, a spoiler-free summary of the books we're talking about tonight. Robin, I'm going to come to you first. Okay, Rob, thank you. So By Way of Sorrow is the story of Aaron McCabe, who is a 30-something criminal defense lawyer in the state of New Jersey in the United States. And um, she practices law with her partner, Dwayne Swisher, who is a former FBI agent. And they are referred a case involving a um, young black trans sex worker who is accused of murdering the only son of one of the richest and most pow powerful politicians in the state of New Jersey. And they take the case on, and one of the reasons they take it on is because Aaron, like Sharice Barnes, the person accused of the murder, is a transgender woman. And so the story revolves around their efforts to defend uh, Sharice, the implications for both Aaron and Sharice in terms of having a transgender lawyer defending a transgender client, and the efforts of the, the powerful politician to do anything within his power, both legal and not so legal, to stop them from finding out the truth. All right, Robin, thank you for that. And uh, Kia, could you just tell us about those people next door? Yes, of course. So those people next door, um, in the novel, we meet Salma, a London teacher who has just moved with her family to a safe suburban development on the outer reaches of the city. And soon after arriving, she receives an invitation to a neighborhood barbecue. And there she meets her next door neighbor, Tom, who's a bit of an alpha male. He's friendly enough, but the next morning, Salma spots him uprooting the Black Lives Matter banner that her son put in their plant pot. And initially she chooses not to say anything, she and her family are new there, they're Asian, so she kind of feels like it's not really her fight. She doesn't want to cause a fuss, so she takes the banner inside and puts it in her window instead. But the next morning she wakes up to find her window smeared with paint. And this time she does confront Tom, who reacts with hostility. And things begin to escalate between the two families, and soon it becomes clear that somebody is going to get hurt. Okay, all right, so we'll get into the questions now. Always impressed when people can describe their books so well without giving away any spoilers, because um, <laughs> it must be so difficult to do, especially with these books where there are so many things that you could give away. Um, okay, Robin, so this is your debut novel, the first in a series featuring Erin McCabe. And Kia, you have also written legal thrillers in the past, mm. um, featuring a former barrister. What is it that attracted you both to this genre and the idea of writing a series around a character in that world. Um, Kia, I'm going to come to you first. Yeah, I really love the idea of a legal thriller because it's such an effective format for building tension. And as we all know, you know, tension is the lifeblood of fiction. And there's several reasons for that. First, there's in a legal thriller, there's a very clear division between the two sides you know you've got to decide who's guilty who's not guilty who's good who's evil uh, and I think that's a really compelling pull for the reader uh, the British legal system is adversarial so that's ripe for high drama and the stakes are usually pretty high so somebody stands to lose their livelihood even their liberty um, but secondly I enjoy examining social issues and I think this is an effective platform 
for doing that, so many of the most vulnerable in society end up in the court system. And so the legal thriller allows us to ask, who are these people? What put them there? What are the systems and mechanisms in place that vilifies some of the most vulnerable in society? But also coming back to what I said before, reader interaction as well. I've had so many people say to me, you know, I could see myself on the, in the jury trying to decide who's guilty, flip-flopping between the two verdicts. And I think that's always a really compelling pull, as I say, for the reader. Okay, and, and Robin, coming to you now, um, we just must point out that By Way of Sorrow is the first of three books featuring Erin McCabe, so the series is, is well underway. Um, what is it about that appeal to you? So in terms of a legal thriller, uh, I, you know, I have been practicing law now for 45 years. So the old, you know, bromide, write what you know. Uh, mm -hmm. you know. As you mentioned at the top, Rob, By Way of Sorrow is my debut novel. And so when I set out to write something, um, you know, I tried to do something that I was familiar with. I, I have been a lawyer. I have been uh, involved in representing people accused of crimes in the state of New Jersey, both in state and federal courts. And I am a transgender woman. So, you know, you write what you know, and, and, and that's where, that's the genesis of it. I, I agree with what Kia said in terms of there's a, a built-in tension within the legal system. It's an adversarial system in the states as well. Uh, and so you have that tension built in uh, as to who's telling the truth, who's not telling the truth. In terms of uh, um, it being a series, I, I will make a confession. I didn't start out to write a series. Um, I started out to write a book and, and hopefully get it published. And uh, when my agent was shopping by way of sorrow around here in the States, um, she came back to me and she said, we have an offer from Kensington Books, which is the, the, my US publisher. And she said, it, it's wonderful. It's a two book deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, Carrie, I don't have two books. <laughs> and she said, you'll write it. And so that's how um, the series came about. So um, I did By Way of Sorrow. The second book that will be coming out in the UK um, shortly will be Survivor's Guilt. Um, and the third book that will be coming out in the States at the end of May is Remain Silent. And they all feature Aaron McCabe and, and Dwayne Swisher um, and revolve around their lives and the cases that they're involved in. They're they're, they are a series, but they're written as standalone. So you could pick up Remain Silent when it becomes available in UK and read it and not have missed anything because you didn't read By Way of Sorrow or Survivor's Guilt, which was an interesting dynamic. And, and fortunately, my editor said to me when I was doing Survivor's Guilt, you can't tell the reader anything that happened in the first book. Otherwise, they won't go back and buy it. And <laughs> very good advice. So. You know, I'd love to know the kind of greats like Ian Rankin, who's stuck with an Inspector Rebus, what their story is. Did they set out to write a series? Because similar to you, Robin, I wrote Take It Back, my debut as a standalone, and the same sort of story, the publisher came back and said, oh, we really love this character, can you write another one? And so I'd love to know, you know, did Ian Rankin set out to write one book, and then 20 books later, he's still writing Inspector Rebus? It's really interesting. Um, yeah, and Kia, I think we should point out that your book, Those People Next Door, is is a standalone, very much a kind of everything happens, everything has a conclusion. Uh, did you approach that in a different way? Yeah, I think so. And it's interesting because often I get asked, is it easier to write a series or a standalone? And there's pros and cons. On one hand, it's harder because you're building characters up from scratch, you're building a world, you're building a plot. Um, but in another way, I think it gives you more freedom. And I think, obviously, I've, I've, I've just written two books in a series, but I know for a fact that, you know, if you have your character hating olives in book one, and then suddenly they're eating olives in book two, you will hear from your readers and they will tell you that Zara does not like olives. And so in that sense, I think, there's less pressure to be consistent um and i think the other thing that i would probably find quite hard is that although each book in a series probably should stand alone 
your character also needs to grow throughout the series and they need to have their own kind of overarching arc as well. And I would find it really interesting and probably quite difficult actually to keep that kind of change and momentum happening over a long series. Um, but obviously readers and writers do it all the time and they do it really effectively. And so, so maybe in the future, I'm actually working on a character now that I think could become a series character. So we'll see how that develops. I love the idea that people are playing detective from one book to the <laughs> other to find the inconsistencies yeah. in the characters. <laughs> Um, now, you've both written kind of diverse protagonists in these books. How important is it to you to, to write those characters and represent those people? Robin, I'm going to come to you first. For me, it's very important. Um, you know, I think representation uh, is, is, you know, key not only to, to kids, but it's key for adults, too. We like to see people who are like us. And when I looked around in terms of what's available here in the States, and I don't know if it's different in the UK, there were or there are only two writers that I'm aware of that were writing um, thrillers that had transgender characters. Um, that's Dharma Kelleher and Renee James. And um, I was, you know, my character was different from theirs in the sense that Aaron McCabe is a lawyer. And so um, I, I wanted to give people what they want, which is a legal thriller or a thriller writ large, however you're drawn to, to the genre. I, so you need to give them that because that's why they're gonna pick up your book and read it. But what my hope was, was to show them diverse characters, um, and show them a, a world that maybe they're not familiar with in terms of, you know, the issues that transgender people face on a daily basis, both in terms of their personal lives and their professional lives. And so for me, it was important to have that representation. It was important to have it authentic. And it was important to have the, you know, characters that people would go, oh, I, I kind of understand what the issues are a little bit better from the perspective of the diverse character. I think one of the things that is kind of really helpful in achieving that in, in your book, Robin, is, is that you've, you've got Erin and you've got Cherise who have these completely different lives, but this shared experience throughout it. And there's all these kind of common points that they find. That to me seems a really powerful way to engage the reader in, in understanding them. And and it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was important to me because let's face it, I am, I, I recognize my own privilege. Uh, I am a white woman. Uh, I was perceived for many years of my life as a heterosexual white male. So, I mean, I've had the privilege that that comes with. And I realize that even as a trans person, I maintain certain privileges. And so it was important for me to show that not everyone is as privileged as even Erin is in the book, um, and that Sharice has had a much different experience as a black trans woman than Erin has had as a white trans woman. And, it's, and so it was critically important for me to have Sharice as powerful and as empathetic a character as Erin was, so that they were equal, because I was telling two stories, even though they came from very diverse backgrounds, as you said, what they shared in common was the fact that they were both trans women and how that impacted their lives. And Kia, coming to you now, I mean, we're talking about diversity and representation in a, in a different context, but again, how important is it to you to write those characters and, and show them in your, in your work? Mm. Like Robin, I think it's really important because historically, as I'm sure we all know, the kind of main protagonists in crime are is usually a tough guy, whether it's the hard drinking cop or I don't know, you get the kind of um, laconic private investigator or super spy. And women traditionally have been either the victims or sidekicks or fodder for the narrative. And what my book and Robin's book does is put women at the front and center of the narrative. And, you know, we have seen that change happening with domestic suspense, for example, but in terms of kind of diverse characters, that's 
brought an extra layer of nuance, but also complexity because as minority women, we have that extra level of responsibility. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, are we allowed to write flawed women of color, flawed trans women? as we are in real life, or do we have that pressure to write positive characters? Um, and that's something I've actually thought a lot about. Um, I find it quite interesting uh, in those people next door, how Salma's relationship with her husband, it's, it's kind of flipped in a way. And then that's put into this context of this suburban kind of, uh, you know, street where she lives. And uh, even even that becomes sort of something that, that the people around them can't grasp and can't kind of understand. It almost serves to, to, to kind of amplify the situation they find themselves in. Yeah, I think setting was really important because I was born and bred in London, a very multicultural part of London. And then in 2018, a uh, year before the pandemic really hit, I moved to a small rural town in the north of England. And although my neighbours were absolutely lovely and it was a beautiful town, what I really lost was my anonymity. And I didn't really consider that before moving there, actually, especially, you know, I was one of the very few people of colour there. And so I knew that you know, if I were to do something untoward, even if I was just a little bit rude to somebody who was walking slowly in front of me, for example, I would be remembered. And so it really changed the way that I engaged with the world. And after the pandemic, I moved back to London. But I just remember that sense of claustrophobia that came A, from being in a small town, but B, the pandemic. And I wanted to show that in the work where Salma already feels quite out of place because she's new there but also this sense of claustrophobia that whatever she does is being monitored. And at one point where her home and her car is getting vandalized, she decides to put up a camera. And there's this scene where, you know, the neighbors are very polite, but they're also quite passive aggressive in, in saying to her, well, this is a nice street. You know, you really don't have any reason to feel unsafe here. And they're obviously speaking from a place of privilege. And so that kind of very closed setting was really important. And as you say, you know, it kind of fed into the tension of the narrative. Both of your books deal with these quite difficult, powerful, emotive topics. How do you, you find the balance between kind of bringing those to the page and achieving what you want to achieve in, in doing that? And also still keeping a, a kind of fun, an entertaining crime thriller that 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 has commercial appeal, I guess, which is obviously a very important part of that process. Um, Robin, I'll come to you first on that one. It is a, it is a, a delicate balance because you you don't want the the message that you're kind of subversively giving to the audience. Um, you know uh, that this is what it's like to be trans. Here are the issues. You don't want that to be so powerful or overpowering that people turn away from the book. So you, you do have to have that balance. Um, in, in my case, because By Way of Sorrow was the first book, um, I, I, you know, my, my agent was, was reviewing it, my, my editor was reviewing it, and I have an independent editor, and, and they certainly commented it along the way about, like, maybe it's too much here, maybe it's too much on this side, or you need to round out this character. So it, it, it's, a, it's a balance, and you, you really strive to get it right, because as I said earlier, at the end of the day, you know, I, I don't write my books for an LGBTQ plus audience. I write my book for the world to read. And hopefully a lot of cisgender people will pick up my book and, and, and read it and enjoy it. And the only way that's gonna happen is if I'm giving them why they came in the first place is to read a legal thriller. Um, so you can't have the message overcome the, the media, you know, medium. Um, you have to have you know, built in the 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 story that people want to see, and yet do it in a way that you know can get your message across. I, I call it, you know, the Mary Poppins method: the spoonful of sugar. <laughs> um, it it helps the medicine go down. So you give people what they want, which is the thriller, and then the medicine is the message. 
but the two things are so so intri intricately intertwined in by way of sorrow that that it you know one serves the other completely they don't sit independently well, th that's certainly the goal because i mean again i i wrote it with two transgender main characters and and so you know woven right into the arc of the story is their stories and and how they relate Sharice's life and how she wound up where she is Aaron's life how she wound up you know doing what she's doing so yes I did try to build it in as part of the narrative so that everything would be seamless and the message wouldn't be overpowering um the story and Kia how has that experience been for you trying to kind of blend the two, the, the, the kind of issue and the message and the story and the plot and get that balance right. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think, look, firstly, if your thriller isn't thrilling, then you're failing as a novelist, aren't you? And so I feel like as a novelist, that's my goal, first and foremost, which is to entertain the reader. Um, the storytelling is probably the most important thing. So plot, uh, but not that detriment to character. And I always say, you know, readers will follow you through 400 pages of a divorce, say, uh, if the character is compelling enough. And so I really feel like the character has to come first and then the plot and then the message, if there is one. And what I always say about my books is they're page turners, first and foremost. And if you want to engage with the issues, then that's great. But if you don't, then you just read a page turn and that's fine. Um, you know, and it's interesting because we talk about thrillers with a conscience, but often you know, I can't think of a crime novel that doesn't deal with an issue of some sort, you know, whether it's violence against women, you know, domestic violence, uh, male rage. Uh, one of my favorite crime novels uh, by J Jim Thompson, The Killer Inside Me, there are still issues in that, you know, and that's what crime does best, isn't it? Even though it's a it's genre fiction and genre fiction can often be looked down upon, it's actually such a great medium for engaging with the big issues and the big themes in life, such as life and death and violence and revenge and all of that stuff and so yeah you know firstly I make sure that the characters are there the plots there but also one thing I do need to remind myself of is to just trust the reader and so sometimes you read exposition or dialogue between two characters and it does feel like a sermon or somebody's just saying something to prove a point and I think well actually I can take that out and I can trust the reader to understand what I'm trying to say and sometimes that can be a bit subtle. Um, I remember with Take It Back, uh, my first novel, so the premise of that was four Muslim boys are accused of assault by a white girl and the fallout from that. And the message, so to speak, of that novel was we choose to do things because we choose to do them as individuals, not because of the colour of our skin or the faith we believe in. And I just remember a line, you know, and it wasn't subtle at all. It was one of the boys. And at the end, he said something like, you know, it's one faith, but we're not all the same. The only actions I can be said to represent are mine. But I still had readers kind of griping about the fact that I had negative Muslim characters in that novel. And I thought, you know, I would still like prefer to err on the side of I'm just going to trust the readers. And if some miss the message, that's OK. I would rather that than kind of hit them over the head with it. Um, that kind of leads me on to my, my next question quite nicely, and, and particularly in, in those people next door, you've got this underlying racial tension and these kind of microaggressions that are occurring uh, in this sort of seemingly idyllic residential area. How, how do you approach writing kind of quite volatile situations like that? Do you, do you, is there, a, is there a sort of process you go through when you're dealing with something that's potentially quite sensitive? Mm. Well, I think firstly, you have to do your research. Um, and so like Robin, a lot of my work has come from personal experience, you know, whether that's the kind of vilification of the Muslim community in headlines or homophobia in, in the uh, South Asian community, um, next of kin, my third book dealt with kind of childlessness and childless women and the way they're treated in the media. But beyond that, I think, A, you have to talk to experts, you have to talk to the people that you're representing in your book. So I spoke to a number of survivors, I spoke to uh, ISVAs who are independent sexual violence advisors in the UK, 
police officers, barristers. So you've got to do your research to make sure that you're representing those communities in an authentic and sensitive way. But secondly, I, I do think you have to be a little bit brave and not self-censor. And I think particularly in this day and age, it's very easy to think, oh my God, I can picture what the Twitterati are going to say about a specific line or a specific trope maybe. But I think as long as you've done the research and you can back what you can back up your writing, I think you should be brave and not self-censor. And Rob, in a similar similar question for you, obviously writing transgender characters, being transgender yourself, the, the kind of battle for transgender rights at the minute is is a thing that evolves on a almost a daily basis. How conscious of you, of that were you when writing your characters? I'm very conscious of it, but as Kia said, you know, you have to, you know, I'm very aware that I am one transgender person with one transgender lived experience. And just as Aaron's experience as a transgender woman in the book is different from Sharice's transgender experience, um, I have to be aware that as a writer, uh, I am coming it from it from my own point of view, and I can't do that, that I have to be sensitive to my characters and who they are and what their lived experiences most likely would have been. And so like Kia, you do your research, you, you speak with people, you have people who do have similar lived experiences of your characters, review the work to make sure that it's authentic and that your character is real and three-dimensional because the worst thing that you can do as an author is, is misrepresent the people that you're trying to represent. Um, and so, uh, you know, I always, I, I want to bring transgender characters to the fore, but I also want to be sensitive that just because I'm transgender, that doesn't give me liberty to speak for the entire community. So I do my research. I speak to people, um, I, you know, even even with regard to to Dwayne Swisher. Dwayne is a black man. I'm obviously not a black man, um, and, but you know, I do know lawyers that I've I've kind of modeled Dwayne on. But but I spoke to them and I said, you know, is this okay? Um, and and you know, I, I was very gratified that um, you know I've done a number of panels with with um, you know various panel members. Uh, one was a judge and a prosecutor. Another was a, a you know, a, a trans woman of color. Um, and, and, you know, two were black men. And, and to a person, they said, you know, you got it right. I mean, uh, so that is when you feel good as an author, that you know that you have represented, um, that your characters accurate, accurately represent the people that you saw them as. Um, and so... You have to be careful. You have to do your research. You can't make assumptions that you know everything just because you have one lived experience um, because all of our communities are very broad and diverse. And so if you're going to speak for a broad and diverse you know, community, you have to make sure that the voices in your books express that those points of views. So, um, yeah, one thing I would add to that is you know, authentic doesn't always mean positive as well. And I come back to what I said earlier, you know, this is something that I've thought about a lot. And telling me, especially pertaining to the Muslim community, telling me that I should or have to write positive Muslim characters, for me is almost just as stifling as expecting me to uphold these stereotypes of what a Muslim character is. And I feel like true equality will be when we're allowed to write, you know, angry women of colour, angry Muslims, um, flawed, selfish, and not just positive characters. Um, and, and I think we're a long way away from that. You know, me as a Muslim writer, I'm probably a bit closer to that than Robin is or is allowed to be as a trans writer. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get there. You know, the solution to that is to have more of us, you know, the more Muslim writers there are, the natural proliferation of positive and negative stories and we'll get you know the funny comedy novels and the romances and the sci-fis and gritty crime and we'll just have a diverse mix of people who are different and not just kind of totems for a community and I think that's kind of the Shangri-La that we're working towards.
I, I, I would just jump on that and say, you know, given, it, it certainly, I know it, it's similar in the UK, but given what's going on here in the States in terms of the current political climate towards transgender, non-binary mm. people, um, you know, I hear what you're saying, Kia, and, and I agree with you 100%. It would be wonderful to write that evil trans character mm. because not all trans people are perfect. But I feel like right now that there's so little representation yeah. uh, in literature, in novels, in, in you know thrillers, whatever you want to, whatever genre you want to pick of trans characters, that it's important, at least for now, um, mm -hmm. for trans characters to be positive characters because it, it's the counterbalance to what everybody else is hearing in the media, reading online. And, and so it's kind of trying to balance the narrative a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Robin, something that comes through, which I found quite kind of difficult to read in your book, quite moving, is is that, you know, you, you can make your best effort to to write these trans characters that are well-rounded, different individuals. But you see the treatment they face, you know, uh, Aaron's treatment within the legal system, Sharice's treatment uh, in the kind of prison system, um, they face endless barriers that other people do not. Well, Rob, I, I think something happened. Oh, yeah. have we got you? Um, so I'm not sure how much of that you got. I was, I was they, talking they, about the- Endless barriers that other people don't. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's kind of it. That's just just kind of highlighting that point, and and obviously you're you're very aware of that writing those characters. Um, so I mean, you can do as much as as you can do as a writer to to write them in a way that you feel comfortable with that's positive. But the reality is, those characters face all those challenges all of the time, and that's probably a very real thing. It is a real thing, and, and look, it's a real thing not for just for trans people. It, it, it's a real thing for people of color. It's a real thing for immigrants. It's a real thing for for various religious communities. It's a real thing for a lot of people that you know the system isn't always fair, and who you are and your economic status matter a lot. It, I mean, I don't know, I can't speak to the UK in, in terms of the justice system, but it certainly matters. Uh, unfortunately, it matters in, in the US. And, and you know, I think those are issues that whether you're, you're trans or, or not, if you are from, uh, you know, a community that has historically faced discrimination, you can identify with what's going on. I mean, the same, you know, the same things that impacted um, uh, Sharice in some regards, yes, I mean, there, there's the issues of, of where she's gonna be held in custody and, and those are unique to, to her being transgender. But there are other issues that are just unique to her being a black woman. Um, and, and all black women can identify with that. And so, yes, there are certain things that are specific in terms of the characters and the way they're treated because they're transgender, but there, there's a universal dynamic in play too in the, the way the system treats anybody that is not white, heteronormative, Christian, um, and coming from you know, a place of, of some economic wealth. Okay, I just want to remind everyone that's joining us this evening, you can submit your questions for Robin and Kia, just do it in the chat. I can see there's loads in there already. We're going to get to those in about 10 minutes. Um, I've got a few more questions to ask you both before that. Um, now, you've both got quite interesting backgrounds professionally. Robin, you told us you spent, you've been a, an attorney for many, many years. And Kia, I believe you used to work or do work in tech. Um, I'm interested in if you can tell us a bit more about those parts of your life, but also how much of your career and your kind of personal history inspires your writing, or if it's simply that you love crime and thrillers and that's that's why you do it. Um, Kia, I'll come to you first. 
Yeah, so Rob, you know, storytelling has always been so important to me and it's always played a big role in my life. And I remember when I was four years old, I was a little brat and basically refused to eat unless my mum told me a story, bless her. And, and she was just a natural storyteller. And my mother tongue, which is Sileti, is very much an oral language. There's not much literature in written in that language. And so she was a very skilled storyteller and I grew up listening to those stories. But when it came to choosing a degree at university or what Americans call college, I followed the money and I did tech, um, worked in tech for three years and then took a 50 percent pay cut to become a writer. Um, I'm still recovering. Um, <laughs> so I do look upon my friends, you know, who stayed in tech and have ten sized flats with great envy. But for me, it was the right decision. But actually, th those years in tech weren't wasted. I remember you're you're trying to do similar things whether you're coding or writing fiction you're trying to express an idea in the most elegant and simple way possible and actually one of the best writing tips I ever got was from one of my computer science professors and he said never say this facilitates the utilization of the product when what you mean is this makes the product easier to use and I've taken that with me throughout my whole writing career um, and so you know, two effects. One, it allowed me to build a buffer where I could take a 50% pay cut to become a writer. But secondly, yeah, it taught me a lot of the kind of technicality behind language. And so that's really helped. Um, but also, you know, just simple stuff like doing my own website and, as well. And that's helped. So those years weren't wasted. That's good to hear. And, and Robin, um, you, you're still working as an attorney, I believe. So you're... I your, your, your writing and your work, it all, it all complements each other. Yeah, no, I've always wanted to write. Um, I started my first novel. Oh, boy. I mean, and now it, I've already told you I've been practicing law for 45 years. So I, I probably started my first novel about 43 years ago. Um, it sits in a briefcase to this day. I mean, it's on yellow legal pads. You know, there was no word processors <laughs> or computers back then. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a, a legal career, marriage, three, three wonderful children, um, those things kind of came along and interfered. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, back in, I guess it was 2010, I had, you know, come out and gone through, um, the gender affirmation process and, and uh, you know, uh, had a little bit more spare time. The, the kids were grown. And um, my my oldest son, or my middle son, I should say, um, is also a writer, got me going again um, through a, a contest here in the States. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, you write what you know. Uh, I've done a, a lot of criminal defense. I was one of 22 attorneys that uh, participated in a in a 21-month criminal trial uh, in U.S. District Court in the District of New Jersey. It's the longest criminal trial that ever took place in New Jersey, and all of the defendants were found not guilty. Um, I was a young lawyer at the time. It was, it was like my advanced trial practice course because there were so many wonderful lawyers in the case. Um, and, and so all of that informs my writing. All of that is part of you know, my lived experience as a lawyer. And so, um, you know, being familiar with the courts, being familiar how the system works, um, that's integral to, to, you know, the stories that I tell. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question myself, and then we've got so many questions from our lovely audience that we'll move to those. Um, the last one from me is, is that in both of your books, a lot of the, a lot of what happens, a lot of the action kind of stems from miscommunications or people failing to communicate, uh, leading to kind of an escalation of, of kind of uh, drastic proportions. Um, first of all, I hope you think that's a fair assessment, but also I wondered whether you thought that that is actually often quite a common starting point for, for a lot of crime, both in fiction and in and in the real world. Um, Kia, I'll, I'll come to you first. I think that's definitely fair. In my novel, um, again, you know, the tensions start between neighbours and at one point Tom says something to Salma that can be construed in one of two ways. It could just be a throwaway comment or it could have racial undertones. 
And one thing I did try to do in the novel is have a contrast between Salma and her husband, who is a lot more lax, say, uh, and he lets a lot of things slide. Um, and so I definitely think it's it can be those kind of petty mis misunderstandings or failures of communication can be um, the spark, you know, that leads to a lot of conflict, especially in settings where, you know, either domestic suspense or a closed kind of suburban setting. In terms of real life crime, I mean, Robin can probably comment better than I can, but I feel like, you know, the seven deadly sins, pride, lust, vengeance, uh, greed, all of those things are probably um, the root of most crimes. But yeah, I'm sure I'm sure Robin will be able to comment on that. Um, and, and, you know, I think in, in Kia's book, more so than in mine, the miscommunication drives the tension of the thriller part of the story. I think the miscommunication um, aspect of my book is more in the personal uh, dynamics of the characters as opposed to the legal thriller part uh, of the story. So, um, you know, in terms of, of the crime, um, you know, the question is, was it self-defense or not? And, and so there's no question that Cerise was responsible for the death of the senator's son, but was it murder or was it self-defense? And so uh, that's not really a miscommunication. That's a, you know, what happened. Um, but there is the miscommunication that takes place in the personal lives, in particular between Aaron and um, her would-be boyfriend, Mark, and Aaron and Dwayne in terms of their relationship a as partners and lawyers. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the, the crime itself, is, as opposed to Kia, is where that does kind of, that, that miscommunication keeps escalating. Here, the crime is one, you know, it's, it, was it a crime and, and what, what really happened? Okay, we're going to take some questions from our audience now. Uh, the first one is from Linda, and it's for both of you. Um, we've we've covered this a bit, but Linda's come at it from a slightly different way. So um, she's asking that when you are, are covering issues like racism and, and homophobia or transphobia, um, do you feel that you have a moral duty to educate your readers as, as well as entertaining them? Um, Kia, I'll come to you first. I think so, yes. But again, it's almost secondary. So if I had a, if I had to choose between kind of moral education versus entertainment, I would always choose entertainment because at the end of the day, that's why any of us read, particularly fiction. Um, but yes, and often you wonder what side of the debate you're you personally are on. So, for example, in Next of Kin, when I was talking about childlessness and how women are portrayed in the media. Obviously, I had a personal you know, vested interest as a childless woman, um, but equally you have to make sure that you're not being too negative about the other side. You know, um, For example, motherhood is a really difficult job, but as a childless woman, I can be quite critical of that if I allow myself to be. Uh, and so, yeah, you have to sit back and wonder, am I actually on the right side of this? Um, when I'm moral, morally educating somebody, am I actually, you know, on the right, correct moral side of it? Um, so I think, yeah, the short answer is yes, but it's secondary to the kind of entertainment aspect. Okay, and, and Robin, what about you? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, I, I can't picture myself writing a novel that doesn't have a, a moral point of view. Um, even the first one that sits in the briefcase had nothing to do with transgender issues, but it had to deal with the practice of law and some of the, the things that are wrong with the way the practice of law is structured in the States. And so I, I can't imagine ever writing a, a book just purely for entertainment purposes without having some goal to try to educate a little bit on even if it's not on, on, you know, trans topics, LGBTQ topics, uh, just having a, you know, a moral position in terms of the issues, even, you know, you, you, when it's, you're telling the story um, from the point of view of the person that has no morals, you want the audience to get the point that they're 
that there's something wrong here. So um, again, I, I agree that you you want the story, you want people to be entertained. That has to be there. They're not going to buy your books. But it, for me, I can't picture myself writing a book that didn't have a, a moral arc as well. All right, Linda, thank you for that question. Um, this one is from Shannon. It's for Kia. Uh, she says, as your book is a more twisty thriller, did you know where it was going to end up and then work out how to get there? Or did you figure out the ending as you wrote it? Oh, so this book was in a way the hardest that I've written. So it was book four. It was in the middle of the pandemic and I didn't really have the end of the novel. So obviously I knew that somebody was responsible for the crime. And if you've read those people next door, you'll know that it could be one of, you know, four or even five people. And so in my head, I just thought, okay, well, who is A, going to, you, you know, be, be a really good twist, but B, also have a reason to have committed that crime. Um, and some of the kind of crime greats say that they don't plan, but I'm a plotter through and through. I like to know exactly what's going to happen. And I thought, you know, let's not obsess. Let's just try and do it the kind of panther way. And, oh, it was so difficult. And so, no, I didn't know. Um, and I, there were long, long days kind of procrastinating on the sofa instead of at the desk thinking, I don't know, I'm not going to ever be able to finish this novel. Uh, but I think it came off, you know, from the reader fe feedback, it's been good. So I made it through. And what it's done is given me confidence that I can figure out knotty plot issues if I don't have it sorted at the beginning. As a fan of your book, okay. I tell you, absolutely, you pulled it off and you pulled it <laughs> off. Oh, thank you, Robin. <laughs> um, thank you for that question, Shannon. Uh, this question is from Sharon. It is for Robin. Uh, she says, I connected with your book so much. I have a 14-year-old trans son, and I just felt like your book made my son much more normal in society. Um, did you think readers would connect so much with that specific point? Did I think so? I, I, you know, if I'm being honest, no. But did I hope so? Yes. I mean, you never know how readers are going to connect. But certainly, um, there's nothing more gratifying than getting a, an email or, or a tweet or, or a message that says, you know, this was so important to, to me, or, or in this case, to, to her son. Um, I mean, I, it just it, it makes you feel amazing. I, I connected with a, a woman who emailed me and said, you know, not everybody is as nice as the people in, in your stories. You know, my child was bullied um, and ultimately took their own life. And um, it, it's it's so powerful. And we actually started a, an email friendship. And and I'd like to think that in some way that helped her come to some you know, understanding of, of what happened with her child. So when those things happen, it's wonderful. Do you expect it to happen? No, I, I, I don't think I, I think that well of myself to think that I'm going to have that kind of impact. Um, but when it happens, it's absolutely amazing. And I'm so happy to hear that it helped her son. That's that that makes me feel good. I can imagine it must be quite amazing when you when you get feedback like that. Um, Sharon, thank you very much for that question. The next question is for both of you. Um, and I'm just gonna find it because I've scrolled down too far. This one is from Kate R. Uh, Kate wants to know what each of you do to celebrate your publication days. So Kia, you can go first. Uh, so often I'm out to dinner or lunch with my editor, publicist and um, marketer. Um, and then during the pandemic, sadly, it was just like a little cake at home with my husband. Um, I did have a kind of big book launch with the first one. Um, and I think I, I, I'm on book four now, so I think I'm due another one. So that would be quite nice. Has, uh, uh, has anything established itself as a ritual on the publication day? Because there's nothing wrong with a little cake, let's be honest. Well, I mean, alcohol is certainly a ritual. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but no, apart from that, I think, yeah, I think, you know, it's weird. I don't know how what Robin, Robin thinks, but sometimes publication day can feel a little bit anticlimactic. And I think that's why you need to make an effort actually to go out and celebrate because especially with kind of book three and book four, 
the first book or two, you know, you get the box and you, and you pick up your book and you're like, oh my God, it's so amazing. And then book three and four, it's less novel, uh, no pun intended. Um, so I think you've really got to make an effort to actually go out and do something to market because another thing that's inherent with the writing career is when you get there, there's no there there. You know, at first you think I'm going to be really happy with just getting an agent or just getting a book deal or, you know, just selling X amount of copies or just winning an award. And when you get there, it's the next thing. And so my agent's really good at this, actually. She's always good at reminding me, look, this is really big news. Go and put your feet up and celebrate. And so you've really got to mark each little step and each little achievement. Um, and Robin, how do you mark those days when the books come out? Well, so I've had the unique experience, uh, you know, dealing with the, the U.S. market that both of my books came out dur during the p pandemic. Um, so, I, I mean, I have not had a public celebration of, of either of my books. We are planning something for book three. I will actually have a launch party for, for one of my books. Um, Yay! It's taken me a while, but uh, yes, we are we are doing something for book three. So I mean, um, books uh, one and two. You know, I did some virtual stuff in terms of of launches and things like that, um, and um, alcohol was involved. <laughs> but uh, you know, there were there were no big parties, uh, no big celebrations. And, and Kia, I agree with you that publication day is very anticlimactic in some ways because. It's been building up and building up, and and for some reason, you know, maybe I had less of an expectation because it was the middle of the pandemic that you know you expect that it's here and like everything's gonna happen and nothing happens, <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, T tomorrow's another day. <laughs> I feel a bit sad to hear that. So we're all gonna have the party for each of your publication you days going forward, a massive party. Um, Kate, thank you for that question. Uh, this one is from Lauren, it's also for both of you. Uh, Lauren says, I would love to know when you aren't writing and are reading for pleasure, do you read books in the same genre as the ones you write or you, do you read something completely different? Um, Kia, I'll let you go first. Oh, it's a mix really. Um, so I tend to read a lot of crime for work, um, whether it's kind of chairing a panel at, at a literary festival or something that I've been asked to provide a blurb for. But even before I was a crime writer, I was definitely a crime reader. Um, I'm a little bit lowbrow in that I will um, be very influenced in, by whatever's doing really well. So the last three books I bought were Lessons in Chemistry, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, and Fleishman is in Trouble, who, which are obviously very mega big sellers. And so I'm very much influenced by what's kind of in the popular culture at the moment. Um, but then I also do try to make time for classics. I've read embarrassingly few of them. And so earlier this year, I took a reading day and I read Catch-22, which was brilliant. And I and I obviously never read that before. And so I. I feel like if you're going to be a writer, you need to read widely and not just in your genre, but across genres. And, and I I agree. Uh, I will confess that, unfortunately, over the last, you know, three or four years with the books coming the way they've been coming and then having, you know, UK publications and, and reviewing those books and doing things that um, and plus having a full time job practicing mm -hmm. law that I, I have had very little time to read. Um, I, the, the current book that I'm reading is um, Times on Doing by Cheryl Head. Um, it's, a, it's a thriller, but it's not a thriller in the sense that, you know, it's, it's the story of a, um, a young woman who's investigating the, the murder of her grandfather that took place in Jim Crow South. Um, and so it's the reporter story but there's, it's told with going back to, to her grandfather's um, time and, and what led to his murder, and it's fascinating. Um, before that, I finished Hell of a Book by Jason Mott. Um, I don't know if anybody's read that one, but again, totally out of genre. Uh, it, it's um, a hell of a book is all I can say. It's, it's a wonderful um, story uh, about an author and the the book that he's written and how it impacts his personal life. 
Okay, thank you for, for sharing that. And there's a few recommendations in there as well, which is always nice. I've got time for one more question. This one is from at Claire's Books. Uh, actually, initially a comment for you, Robin. Uh, it says, I think Dwayne was a great character to ask questions and allow Erin to give us explanations naturally about her experience in a safe and light way. Um, but Claire really wants to know if you can tell us anything about the second book. Survivor's Guild? Um, Survivor's Guilt is, again, Aaron and Dwayne are, are the main characters. Uh, it's the story, and boy, I hadn't prepared for this, so I, I've been preparing for Remain Silent, which is coming out <laughs> in the States, so now I have to kind of flip my flip the switch and go back to Survivor's Guild. Survivor's Guild is the story of um, Aaron and Dwayne get contacted by, or Aaron gets contacted by a detective, uh, a, a, when I say detective, not a private detective, one that works for a prosecutor's office, uh, about someone who has pled guilty to the murder of their adoptive father um, and is about to be sentenced. And the detective doesn't believe that she really did it. He believes that she confessed for some unknown reason. And um, Aaron and, and Dwayne take up the case, um, and it turns out that um, she did confess for a different reason. And um, so it's the story of what really happened. It um, deals with people who are involved in, in ch child pornography and human trafficking. So it deals with some heavy subjects, but I do it all again. It, there's nothing graphic. Um, you know, I do tell people in terms of, you know, if these things are going to trigger you, be careful. But again, there's nothing uh, graphic about it. Um, and it's um, the story of, of, you know, what really happened and can Aaron and Dwayne uh, get this young woman off from the charges that she's accused of? Well, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Kia, just before we go, can you tell us what's coming next from you? Uh, so I'm writing book five now. Uh, the working title is Blood Ties, but my editor always changes my titles because I'm really bad at them. Um, and it's about a victim of domestic violence who, uh, similar to Robin's actually, admits to killing her husband, uh, but there are some inconsistencies to her story. So is she covering for someone? Is she telling the truth? Um, and then the trial ensues and we find out the truth. More twists and turns in store, I'm exactly. sure. Right. <laughs> we have a very important matter to deal with before we go, which is choosing our winner for the best question, which I'm going to do. And uh, I promise there's been no bribery, none of that going on. Uh, <laughs> I am going to give our prize package of the hardback of those people next door and this rather lovely exclusive edition of By Way of Sorrow to Sharon Rimmel's one um, for her question, because it was such a personal thing to share with us and it's really quite moving to hear. Robin's response to that. So well done, Sharon. You've won our prize package, which also includes that tote bag. And um, I should also add that everyone that signed up for the event today has been entered into a separate uh, prize competition to win the same set of prizes. So, you know, everyone's a winner. Um, right, Robin, Kia, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a fascinating discussion. I've still got lots of questions left on my list. I feel like we should probably do this again at some point in the future. Uh, a big thanks to Sarah Stewart-Smith and the teams at Verve Books and HQ Stories for putting all of this together. Uh, I'm Rob Gillett. You can find me on social media at This Is Queerly, uh, where I talk about books and all sorts of other fun LGBTQ plus stuff. Uh, Robin and Kia, thank you again. Uh, we have to say goodbye. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. All the excellent questions. Sorry if we didn't get to yours. Uh, I hope you all have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you, thank Rob. You. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.